take your copy of God's Word. Uh, we're in John chapter 7, as we had read before. I think it's on page 1071. Now, Tom read earlier, uh, before we began really, uh, the words from Psalms, uh, Psalm 11 for our confession. But actually, if you were following along in your Bible reading plan, you'll know actually uh, that Psalm 12 was also down today. Psalm 12 says this, so let me read this before we come to God's Word. Psalm 12, verse 6, And the words of the Lord are flawless, like silver purified in a crucible, like gold refined seven times. Should we pray? Father, we thank you for these precious words, these flawless words, and we pray that we might find that today for ourselves, that they are without error, that they lack nothing, that we might be fully equipped for the Christian life. We pray that you might teach us of your son today. Amen. Amen. Great. Well, we're in John chapter 7. And I was a a classics teacher, but one thing I'm not is a chemist. But I do know that certain elements combined together make an explosion. So I wonder if you've ever taken a mento. It's a small kind of mint sweet, a little bit like uh, a soft mint. And then you pop it in a bottle of Coca-Cola. <laughs> I couldn't find a great picture. Hopefully this will work. If not, uh, that's fine. Uh, next picture, if you've got it, but that's fine. Yeah, Coca-Cola and Mentos. <laughs> uh, potassium, a little p- block of potassium water. Put it in a bathtub. <laughs> Explosion. And one other thing I found out this week, uh, that if you take a little gummy bear and put it in a test tube of, I think, what is it, potassium chlorate, it starts to flare up and flame, and it looks like it's about to explode. It looks like a a comet in a test tube. That's right. Yeah, a jelly baby would work just as well. That's right. Oh, it's a screaming jelly baby. Great. Well, I'm glad we have a chemistry teacher here. Uh, (laughs) Exactly. The point being, certain elements combine together to make an explosion. And in John chapter 7, we have certain elements that combine together to make an explosion. We have the respectable religious plus the real Jesus equals an explosion. Religious rage, which is why I've titled today's talk uh, Religious Rage. We're going to see that on all fronts. Uh, Religious rage. When the Messiah from above comes into contact with the world from below, we can expect an explosion. And as with any science experiment, any explosion that's going to happen, you need to be prepared. And what if you're not? What if you're not expecting it, not fully equipped? Well, potentially dangerous, harmful, even lethal. And what John is doing here in this passage for us is basically saying, right, time to get on your lab coats, time to get on your safety goggles. This is what's going to happen. Be prepared. He wants us, firstly, to check our own reactions. So when we meet Jesus in his word, we need to check our own reactions. But also, as we take Jesus to the world, we're going to have to check and expect reaction, religious rage, explosion. So it's a massive passage. Uh, That's why we didn't read all of it. And we're not going to be going into every single verse, which will be a breathe a sigh of relief here. Jesus is going up to the festival of the tabernacles, a a big Jewish festival in Jerusalem. So although it's a big passage, there's one big theme, religious rage. We have Jesus and the religious rulers as the kind of main players. Everyone else is kind of circling around this engagement. One big theme, religious rage. And we're going to stop off at three key points in the day, or in the festival. So firstly, before the festival, then halfway through the festival, and then on the last day of the festival. Those are the points John highlights. Those are the three points we're going to drop in to see three characteristics of religious rage. Three characteristics. And the first one is this, that religious rage is eager to get rid of Jesus. Eager to get rid of him. I don't know if any of you have been following uh, the recent BBC adaptation of uh, Les Miserables, or maybe you've seen the musical. Well, amongst other things in the plot line, it follows the story of Jean Valjean, an ex-convict who is relentlessly pursued by Javert, Inspector Javert. And it seems to be for the most petty of crimes. 
But nonetheless, Jean Valjean is a wanted man. And at one point in the adaptation BBC uh, show, uh, Javert suspects that Jean Valjean may be in Paris. So posters go up everywhere. Wanted. Have you seen this man? Mugshot complete. It's a dangerous place to be in Paris because Jean Valjean is a wanted man. Jesus is a wanted man in Jerusalem. There'd be mugshots everywhere. Have you seen this man? He's a wanted man because he is unwanted. That's the point. He's a wanted man because he's unwanted. Now, you could ask the question, why? If you've been following along with John's Gospel, you think, what? isn't this the guy who turned water into wine? Isn't he healing people left, right, and center? I think you got bread thrown at you last week. He's been doing amazing miracles. Why? Why? Well, the tensions began to surface in chapter 5. Jesus healed a man on the Sabbath. It's a big no-no. And then he even claimed God as his father. It's a big no-no. Chapter 6, Doug was helping you with that last week, I believe. Um, Jesus claims to be the bread of life, the bread from heaven that you need to eat from him. And he leaves people grumbling and actually just eventually deciding to not even follow him. Offensive. And in chapter 7, the hostility picks up and really we're gearing up to, yeah, chapter 6, 7, 8, 9. It's tense between Jesus and the religious rulers. And they are eager. Look at just verse 11, just to see just how eager they are to get rid of Jesus. Verse 11. The religious rulers at the festival, now at the festival, the Jewish leaders were watching for Jesus and asking, where is he? Now, judging by verse 1, we know why they're watching for him. Verse 1 says, the Jewish leaders were there looking for a way to kill him. He's a wanted man. Now, in this context, it makes the brother's marketing strategy quite incredible. So Jesus' brothers have suggested to him, your following's not great. Why don't you go and do some public miracles in Jerusalem? That will kind of big up the numbers, get a bit of publicity. Well, if this is the world that he's going into, it's not the best idea. And it's actually nothing at all what Jesus intends to do. So the brother's advice is, Go on, get a bit of publicity, popularity, show some miracles. But it's understandable from their point of view. But from Jesus' point of view, as he understands the world he's in, going into, it's unthinkable. Yes, he will go into the lion's den on the cross, but not yet. Not yet. <laughs> Verse 7 shows us why Jesus will not go up in their way at their time with publicity and miracles. Verse 7, he says, The world cannot hate you, brothers, but it hates me, because I testify that its works are evil. You go to the festival. I'm not going up to the festival yet. So he's not lying. He's not saying, I'm not going, because he does go later. He's just saying, brothers, I'm not going to go your way. I'm not going to seek publicity. I'm not going to seek a following by doing amazing miracles. And just as a side point before we move on, really, I think that it's quite instructive for our mission as we think about church. See, we need to just be clear that these brothers of Jesus are not good mission consultants. We shouldn't get them in and say, well, how are we going to reach the world? How are we going to reach Beckles? Because he's saying, well, pretty much that popularity and publicity are not the aim of the game. Because they're not going to change anyone's heart. And that's the problem. Publicity, miracles, popularity, that's not going to change anything. The aim of the game for us will be preaching and prayer because they're the only things that can change a hostile heart. So just as a side point there, don't take Jesus' brother's advice. They're not good PR consultants for the church's mission. But moving on, uh, Jesus in verse 10 heads up to the festival and then things really begin to hot up in verse 14. And we see our second element of religious rage which is that they are e unable, unable to accept Jesus. So in verse 14, Jesus goes right to the heart of Judaism, the temple, and he stands up and he starts teaching and he says amazing things, so much so that in verse 15, they are astonished. Literally, like, how does this man know so much when he's been taught so little? They just don't understand where his authority teaching the scriptures comes from. 
he's not been trained with the rabbis. They're astonished, yeah, but they are unable to accept it, unwilling to accept it. And Jesus puts his finger on it. In what actually, it's quite a big chunk and it seems slightly bewildering. I don't know if you thought that as you read through, you think, whoa, what is Jesus saying? I think I get what he's saying, but I'm not sure. Well, in a nutshell, this is what it is. In verses 14 to 36, he's saying about himself and about them. So you need your focus on this, and then you'll get the rest of it. What's he saying about himself? That his teaching is from God the Father because he is from God the Father. That's what he's saying about himself. His teaching is from God the Father because he himself is from God the Father. That's what about him. And about them, well, they're unable to accept him. They're unable to accept his teaching because they neither want to obey God, nor do they know God. About them, they neither want to obey God, nor do they even know him themselves. So firstly, let's have a look at that. They didn't want to obey God. That seems quite a a strong claim for a, a respectable Jew. Verse 16, have a look down with me. Jesus answered them, My teaching is not my own. It comes from the one who sent me. Anyone who chooses to do the will of God will find out whether my teaching comes from God or whether I speak on my own. His teaching is from God. But they don't want to obey. If they did want to obey, well, they'd receive his teaching for what it is. They don't want to obey nor do they even know God. Skipping forward to verse 28, this is the next offensive thing that Jesus says. Not only do they not want to obey him, they don't even know God. Verse 28. And then Jesus, still teaching in the temple courts, cried out, Yes, you know me, and you know where I'm from. I'm not here on my own authority, but he who sent me is true. You do not know him. But I know him because I am from him and he sent me. He is from God. But they won't accept him. They don't even know God. So if they did know God, what would they do? They would receive him when he came right to them. They don't want to obey God and they don't even know God. Now, just to illustrate that, I want you to imagine that you were out for dinner uh, with some friends. And they started uh, telling you a a whole load of stories about their recent trip to London. They'd had a whale of a time by the sounds of it. They um, lived the high life, seen all the uh, tourist highlights, been to all the hot spots. And so you you said, oh, right, okay. Um, You asked them, did you get to visit the London Eye? And they said, yeah, yeah, the the food was all right, wasn't it? Uh, It's a bit pricey. Okay. So you then begin to ask, well, did you, have you, did you see Big Ben? And they laugh and say, yeah, he was enormous, wasn't he? <laughs> okay. You then get out your phone and think, no, no, no. This is Big Ben. Yeah, it's in the, the, the bell in the clock tower in London. And they look at you as if you're mad. As in, what are you talking about? Okay, hopefully that won't happen to you. But the point being, they claim full knowledge of London. But they show absolutely no knowledge of London whatsoever. They didn't know what Big Ben was. They didn't know what the London Eye was. They claimed to have had full knowledge of it. But they showed no knowledge. It's exactly what the religious rulers are doing here. Exactly what's happening here. See, they claim full knowledge of the one true God. And yet they show no knowledge of the one true God. Because they neither know him nor want to obey him, they're hardly going to recognise him when he comes right to meet them in their faces. See, they're unable to accept Jesus from above because these religious rulers belong to the world below. You see, that they don't receive him says nothing about Jesus and everything about them. You see, he really is God's son. And they really, clearly, are not God's people. 
And that's just shown just as an incident in verses 19 to 24 uh, by their desire to murder him. They want to break the law that they claim to hold so strongly to. See, the Jews, they thought nothing of, um, of circumcision on the Sabbath, but they had a real big problem with Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath. They had a problem with him healing a man. But what are they trying to do? They're currently trying to murder a man. <laughs> do you see the hypocrisy? He's a lawbreaker! But they want to murder him. They're lawbreakers. Now, Jesus' teaching leads to much confusion. Uh, people don't know where he's from. They don't know where he's going. You may have picked that up as we went through. But the big theme stands the same. Jesus is responded to with aggression and hostility. Just look at verses 30 through to 32. You see that big theme. Jesus says, you do not know him. And then in verse 30, at this, at his teaching, they tried to seize him, but no one laid a hand on him because his hour had not yet come. Still, many in the crowd believed in him. They said, when the Messiah comes, will he perform more signs than this man? I.e., no, <laughs> this must be the Messiah. But the Pharisees heard the crowd whispering such things about him. But then the chief priests and the Pharisees sent temple guards to arrest him. Aggression, hostility. See, the belief of some is great, isn't it? But it just highlights the unbelief of these rulers, these Pharisees who should have known so much better. And the shock of the passage is the shock for us today that such very religious people could be so set against the one true God when he comes in person. Very religious, but raging against Jesus. Now, it's hard to say, isn't it? But it will be true then of the, of the friendly Muslim, the, the generous JWs. I saw them out um, in force uh, in, around Castle Hill just yesterday. They're lovely, most of them, aren't they? Uh, the generous JW, the amiable Anglican, easygoing, agnostic. Uh, really, the label counts for little, the, the, the adjective counts for little. You see, if we don't have the biblical God in the biblical Jesus, then we don't have life. No matter how religious we are, if we're set against him, we don't have life. Now that's hard to hear. See, I think of a man I met recently on the uh, streets of Starport. His name's Pat. Uh, he's, um, I, it was, for me, it was a shock the first time I met him to realise that Pat uh, wasn't a woman because I'd just seen Pat's fish bar and I assumed it must be a kind of Starport lady who ran a fish bar. Turns out Pat's a Greek Cypriot. Um, and a big businessman, a lovely family man, and a devout Greek Orthodox. And he, he prays every day, he goes to church every week, and yet he wants actually nothing to do with Jesus. When I talk to him, he wants nothing to do with him. So he makes a joke about it, he's really friendly, but he wants nothing to do with him. See, it's not about how morally upstanding we are, how socially acceptable we are, it's about whether we're following Jesus. So the Jewish leaders were the prime example, law-abiding, socially significant, religiously respectful, moral, they were mannered, <coughs> and yet they didn't want Jesus. You see, all of that stands for nothing. So if you stand, nothing, that doesn't stand for anything before a holy God. If you're standing against a holy God, then your morality won't, won't stand up for much. And that sounds, yeah, pretty hard to hear, pretty intolerant. And yet it's from the words of Jesus. He says in verse 28, you do not know God. That is shocking. And yet it, it's not intolerant in the sense that we assume. It's not exclusive in, the, in that they're not invited to the party. It's not that they're not invited to him, but that they won't come to him. See, what happens when Jesus openly invites, stands up in the temple and says, come to me? Well, yeah, you've guessed it. Unsurprisingly, they don't come to him. And that's just our, our third, final point. Our religious rage is unwilling to come to Jesus. Unwilling to come to Jesus. Now, you saw my daughter, Caitlin, earlier. Oh, well, I want you to know that Caitlin has a BFF best friend forever, in case you hadn't realised. That's something I've learned. 
She has a yeah, little necklace with a unicorn and BFF on it. Now, Caitlin and Ella do everything together. They walk to school together, they sit together, they have lunch together, they play together, so much so that it came up at our parents' evening that they do everything together. And so we were all eagerly expecting the big day. Ella's birthday. Ella's birthday party. Except there was one problem. Because when the invite came, today was the big day. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, so you can commiserate with her later. <laughs> um, she was very good about it. You see, the point was not that we wouldn't come. Yeah, if we could have, we'd have been there like a shop. The thing is, yeah, we just couldn't. We couldn't go to the party. <laughs> We're on the other side of the country. But that is not the case with these Jewish leaders here. It's not that they can't come to the party. It's that they won't. They won't come. We see that in verses 37 through to 52 particularly. So what is Jesus inviting them to? What kind of party? Well, very famous words, verse 37 to 38. He gets up in the middle of the last and the greatest day of the festival. And he says, Let anyone who comes to me drink. So let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Whoever believes in me, as the scripture has said, rivers of living water will flow from within them. He's inviting them. He stands up in the middle. Come. Now, we're slightly wondering what to. What's the party? What's it all about? What is he inviting them to exactly? And context is really key here. I'm afraid you're going to have to get your Old Testament hats on for this. Uh, we are thinking about one of the biggest Old Testament festivals ever, the, fe the Festival of the Tabernacles. If we can get the next picture up, that would be helpful. Well, this was the longest festival of the Jewish uh, times. It was about a week long, happening about September or October. And Jews from all over the place, all over the region, would flock to Jerusalem. I don't know if you ever, well, I, at the moment we live quite near Cheltenham. And at the weekend or the week of the Cheltenham races, well, everyone in Cheltenham despairs because there's no parking spaces, everything goes up in price, the city is crammed, well, the town is crammed because of the event that's happening. Jerusalem will be the same, full of Jews come for the Festival of the Tabernacles. And they'll all be um, living in kind of temporary shelter. They'll have set up leaves and branches to make little booths, kind of covers, tabernacles. That's why you'll see in some of your Bibles, the Festival of the Tabernacles or booths, something like that. You've got to ask why. Why is everyone coming to this festival at this time to take a week out of their year? Well, two reasons. First one, Leviticus 23 gives us, to remember God's provision. So Leviticus, God commanded uh, Israelites to do this. You must keep this festival so your descendants will know that I made the Israelites live in temporary shelters when I brought them out of Egypt. To remember God's provision. Back in the wilderness days when he rescued them from Egypt, out of slavery, into a desert. And yet he kept them and preserved them and kept them alive. And two key elements of the festival that would have happened that, that we don't know about necessarily just remind us of why they did that. So firstly, uh, there would have been a water drawing ceremony every morning. The priest would get a golden flagon of water, scoop it out of a pool. Second ceremony, they would be lighting a lamp. Lighting a lamp, drawing water. To remind Israel, you know, in the wilderness, God provided water from a rock for you in the wilderness. And the lamp, you, you had God's presence with you. There's a pillar of fire in the wilderness. Put simply, to remember. To remember God's provision for them in the wilderness. But it was not just to look back. Why were they doing this festival? It was to look forward. Not just to remember God's provision, but to wait for God's Messiah. Next quotation from Isaiah chapter 4, 44. Just reminds us, what were they waiting for? Why did they have this festival? It was not aimless. God said of the future, I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon my offspring, your offspring, and my blessing on your descendants. They shall spring up among the grass like willows by flowing streams. Did you notice the similar language that Jesus is using? This is what they were waiting for, the coming age of the Messiah, the coming party when he would come. 
So just picture the scene. It's the Jews process around the temple. They process to the pool, draw the water, walk back to the temple, pour out the water as an offering to God. Well, they're not just pouring water on the ground. They are remembering, remembering the pouring of water from the rock in the wilderness and waiting, waiting for the pouring of the Spirit in the messianic days. And then Jesus says, it's here. It's here, now. It's me. It's me. Verse 37. Let anyone who is thirsty come to me and drink. Come to me. He's saying, I'm the fulfillment of the festivals, the promises. It's me you've been waiting for. Come to me. See, the very God to whom they were giving thanks has come right amongst them. He has come to them, and now he calls them to come to him. And we are going to come to their reaction, but you've probably guessed it already. But before we do that, we need to come to our reaction, your reaction. Jesus calls you to come to him. So last week in in John chapter 6, Jesus called you to eat the bread of life. Chapter 7, he calls you to drink the waters of life. See, when you were hungry and starving and thirst and dying in your sin, he called you to eat of him, to feast on him, fill yourself with him, his saving death, his resurrection in your place. This is living food. But now, he says, no, 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 you're not just hungry. You're thirsty. You're dehydrated. You are dying in your sin. So come to me. Drink from me. A satisfied life. A sustained life. The Spirit-filled life. He says, where do you get it from? Come and drink from me. Now, if you've not done that, can I just plead with you that... You're remaining cut off from a God of light and life and love and just choosing to stay in darkness and disconnection if you do not come to him to drink. I don't know if that's the case for anyone here. But don't leave here without doing business with him, without coming to him to quench your thirst, to sustain your life. Then that's how you should respond. But how do the Jews react? You have already guessed it. Unsurprisingly, they're unwilling to come to him. This is particularly the Jewish leaders. So while some in verse 40 are convinced, others are just plain confused. Like, I thought we'd know where the Messiah is from. Well, the Pharisees stand back and they simply condemn everyone who would even think about coming to him. You're thinking about coming to Christ? How, how could you? See, they rebuke the guards who don't do anything. (laughs) They react very strongly to Nicodemus, don't they, when he just makes a very sensible suggestion about a fair trial. um, Is this how things are normally done? (laughs) And they jump on anyone who has any interest in Jesus. And there's just this massive irony as we come to the end of the passage in that they're celebrating the festival, but they hate its fulfillment. And they're condemning these people who are coming to Jesus. And yet, in doing so, they are condemning themselves. So, they call the crowd ignorant, but they simply are showing themselves themselves to be ignorant. That's it. Three characteristics of religious rage. Three characteristics. I want to leave you with two brief implications. We've touched on them through two brief implications. Firstly, religious rage should shape our expectations. It should shape our expectations. We said that right at the very beginning. You know, if Jesus faced the world's rage, then you will too. And we need to know that in advance. So perhaps if you're not a Christian here, we want to be honest with you and say that we're not going to cut the price tag. This is what happens when you follow Christ. Yeah, cast iron certainties and blessings, but religious rage. Be prepared for that. Perhaps some of you as Christians already know that, whether it's family or friends, colleagues who react quite strongly, who dismiss you and your faith. Well, be be encouraged. You are in good company. 
If this is how they treated your master, then you're in good company. Be encouraged. But I think secondly, it should just bring us to encouragement. I don't want to end on a note of saying, go out into the world, face religious rage, and like it or lump it. Because <laughs> that's not really what we have in mind here. Religious rage should give us encouragement. See, in our day and age, we often get ground down by just plain apathy. I don't know if that's your experience. That certainly has been mine. Um, just recently, I was on, on the streets of a local town near us trying to ask people, uh, if you could ask God one question, what would you ask? One guy kind of walks past, probably wouldn't, mate. <laughs> so, no, complete apathy. Just not, not bothered. <laughs> the, that wasn't the only one, but that was probably the most, yeah, yeah, the one I could actually tell you, the response I could tell you. Uh, but anyway, uh, verse, we could retranslate verse 43, couldn't we? So verse 43, John says, the people were divided because of Jesus. I think for our days, it feels sometimes like the people were not bothered <laughs> about Jesus at all. Well, this should give us wonderful encouragement in this passage. Religious rage should give encouragement. Because look what happens. Exposure to the real Jesus will ensure that apathy is driven far away. So you might talk about God, Christianity, religion, church, and you might not get much of a rise. Start talking about Jesus and what he did and what he said in the Bible, you're going to get not just a rise, but religious rage. Like Mentos in Coke, potassium in water, gummy bear in the, is it the flaming jelly baby? Jesus in the world brings a reaction, a response rage. But I just want to encourage you there. Yes, there will be rage, but we've touched on it, haven't we? It's not just rage in this passage. There is repentance. People rage, but many believe. He drew you. He drew people here. He'll draw others to his son. The religious rage should prepare our expectations, but it should give us Encouragement as we go into the world. We can let the fireworks fly as we let Jesus fly. We're going to sing a song now, uh, which is simply a 